Tonight we're going to talk about Jimmy Doolittle's Tokyo Raiders. And I'm sure you all remember it from reading in school, 30 seconds over Tokyo, maybe seeing a movie about it. Well, we have some people here tonight who know a lot more about that mission. Remember, 7th of December, 1941, the day that will live in infamy. And we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And that brought us into World War II. We were defeated badly at that point, and as the war continued right after that, in the ensuing months, we were having trouble. We lost Wake Island, we lost Guam. Things were going downhill, and we needed something to pick up the spirits of the United States. And so just four months later, while our country was at an emotional low, and things were going bad in the Pacific, we called on, at that time, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. And we said, Jimmy, we want you to do a raid. And we want you to use these B-25 Mitchell bombers. And we want you to take them to the heart of the Japanese Empire. The American spirits were sagging. They were low. And they needed something to boost them. We asked him to fly off a Navy carrier. The airplanes had never done this. Bombers had never flown off a carrier. It was the USS Hornet that they flew up from. 16 airplanes, five men to a crew, 80 men total. It was a well-planned mission, but at the last moment, the Doolittle Raiders had to launch earlier than they wanted, and they had to launch farther from the target than they wanted. And by the way, they knew at that point they didn't have the fuel to complete the mission that they were assigned. And the man that we have with us tonight, <clears throat> The hero that we have with us tonight flew on this first airplane off the carrier deck because he was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot on that mission on the 18th of April, 1942, 70 years ago, Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole, United States Air Force. <laughs> and they didn't even hear what you did yet. That's pretty good. <laughs> now let me tell you a little bit about Dick Cole because he was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. He was born in 1915. He was born in 1915. And I can see Charlie over here. He's trying to count on his fingers. Yes, he's 96 years old. <laughs> and let me tell you this because it's kind of interesting and shows you the perspective of the gentleman that we have with us tonight because he was mowing lawns and delivering newspapers in the neighborhood of Orville Wright. Lieutenant Colonel Cole was an air cadet in 1940, and he received his pilot's wings in 1941. And after this mission that we're gonna talk about in a little bit here, he continued flying missions in the Pacific. He flew air commando missions behind Japanese lines, and he remained in our United States Air Force until he retired in 1967. We fashioned a daring scheme to have the Hornet launch a force of bombers and strike at Tokyo from the sea. All the volunteers for this secret and hazardous job had been specially trained by Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. While under destroyer escort, the 80 Tokyo Raiders held a deck ceremony with Japanese medals. Do a little fast one of these to a 500 pound bomb. The medals were going to be returned with interest. Flash to the flight deck, the 16 B 25s had a rough voyage. Hoping to reach a takeoff point 450 miles from Japan, but ready to start an event of discovery, the crews kept fit. They were discovered. After avoiding two enemy patrol vessels, the task force realized they were sighted by a Japanese picket boat. The Hornet escort promptly sank. Since secrecy had been compromised and fearing an alarm all over Japan, Doolittle, forced into the decision, ordered the planes to be launched. This was 800 instead of 450 miles from Tokyo, and 10 hours earlier than planned. 
spite of the last second change, preparations went according to reversal. Only 467 feet of clear deck faced two little sleep ship. The rest barely had room in which to rev up. The last plane hung precariously out over the stern of the horn. After the wind-up by the flight officer, Doolittle made his run down the plunging deck. some of the things you heard about the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo. So Colonel Cole, are you ready for the first question or do you have any opening comments or anything? Yes, sir. Could you please describe your practice sessions for the mission? And part two of the question is, how did you get that big airplane off in such a short distance? Okay, let me repeat this for everybody out there. He's asking about the practice session. Did you do much practice and how did you get that big airplane off that carrier in such a short distance? Uh, we were 
sent to Anglinfield, Florida. And uh, it's a, at that time, it was a very remote base. And uh, one of the big reasons we were sent there was for security. Uh, the Navy, who we couldn't do without for this mission, uh, assigned a <coughs> lieutenant pilot. He taught us how to make a carrier takeoff. Uh, they marked out distances on the runway, and uh, we had to take off ahead of the, the marked out on the runway. Uh, the Navy at that time only had four carriers, and uh, they did not want to have airplanes taking off behind the island for fear of a one might drift into the island. And uh, so we were limited to 498 feet. Uh, and, uh, the, the training was not too rigorous. And in the case of uh, Colonel Doolittle, he uh, qualified in three attempts. And the idea was to get your nose at an angle that would, where your tail skin would not be rubbing, but you had full flaps, full power, and uh, in the first uh, maybe uh, a few minutes of flight, the only thing that's keeping you in the air is the thrust. We had about 35 knots of uh, wind over the deck, and we had about 25 knots of the wind uh, from the carrier. So to be airborne, we figured we would probably need 20 knots, which we had more than that, which was very good. And uh, originally, everybody thought that uh, the most challenging time would be the takeoff. It, it turned out to be one of the easiest, uh, to the point that uh, Doolittle thought it could be done at night. He was asking how many raiders made it back to the carrier. <laughs> that would have been difficult. Uh, when we left the carrier, uh, that was it. We had no uh, course but to proceed on the mission. Uh, as soon as we left, the, the carrier turned around and headed back to Hawaii. Uh, That's us Navy guys. Uh, although, I will say this, that uh, the Marines did mount a hook on a B-25 uh, and land on a carrier. And of course, it was experimental, and uh, uh, they didn't pick up on it. Okay, thanks. But all 16 airplanes either crashed into the sea or they bailed out. And you can certainly ask Colonel Cole about bailing out and everything. But, okay, how did all of you survive? Can you talk a little bit about your survival from after you bailed out, as long as as well as some of the other ones that we talked that uh, were with you that day? Uh, as we approached uh, China, uh, there was a big warm front over to China at the time, uh, and that was about the dusk. We could just barely see the Chinese coast. Uh, supposedly, uh, as the plan was, there was supposed to be a mobile homer, the, a directional homer, stationed at the field we were supposed to land and gas up and go on into the western China. Unfortunately, the airplane carrying the homer crashed and uh, Consequently, there was no homer. Uh, also, the warm front, uh, with the thunderstorms and uh, lots of lightning and fog, had socked in everything from the coast in 
about uh, maybe 300 miles. So we had nothing to uh, give us a knowledge of where we were or where we wanted to go. Uh, we couldn't have made an approach uh, to any place because of, of the weather. Uh, and that uh, left us with the option uh, of, uh, the only option of flying on course until our fuel was defeated and uh, uh, jumping out. Uh, a couple of the airplanes uh, uh, opted to make belly landings, which uh, were successful. Uh, the rest of them bailed out, except uh, one airplane who had uh, extremely uh, uh, gasoline problem, uh, opted to go after he bombed Tokyo to the Vlad of Vostok. He, he landed wheels down, and uh, since uh, Stalin was in a, a war with Germany on the west front, he didn't think much of getting in a war with Japan on the, the eastern front. So uh, to play the political problem, he uh, put them in house arrest for 14 months. And sir, how did you, what, what did, did you end up bailing out? Uh, when we had Colonel Doodle uh, got on the interphone and said, we're going to have to bail out. Uh, at that time, we were at 9,000 feet uh, in, in the soup. Uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, very rough, a lot of turbulence and rain and lightning. But uh, all of our crew bailed out successfully. Uh, in my case, uh, I, my chute drifted over a pine tree. Uh, that, uh, and uh, I didn't touch the ground until the next morning. I know I dozed off, and, uh, but I didn't sleep, uh, being uh, scared and uh, wondering what was going to happen next. Uh, but uh, uh, when the daylight came, uh, I climbed down. I was a little more agile than I am now. <laughs> and and uh, each of us had a compass. And uh, the place that we were supposed to land, uh, we were about 60 miles northwest of the place we were supposed to land. But in between it was a mountain range. So we came down in a, a more or less isolated area. Uh, we weren't able to uh, get together with any of the other crews until we ended up in a place called uh, Hen Yang, which uh, the Tenter Force sent a uh, C-47 in and picked us up and took us to uh, uh, Chongqing, which was the capital at that time. Uh, uh, after I got out of the tree, I started walking west uh, because knowing that if I went east, I was walking to a Japanese hand. And uh, I walked all day, and at about dusk, I came out on a hill, and down below were three or four buildings that had Chinese nationalist flags flying above. So I walked down to those buildings and was a, accosted by a young uh, Chinese soldier. He took me to a building. In the building was uh, nothing but a table and a chair. Uh, but on the table was a sketch that somebody had drawn of a two-tailed airplane with, with five parachutes coming out of it. Uh, and uh, after some more uh, uh, bickering, I guess, to trying to get him to take me where he took the, the uh, sketcher, uh, he did, and uh, I walked in the building, 
and he was going to do them. And I said, boy, am I glad to see you. <laughs> greeted me and said he was happy that I wasn't injured and so forth. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the other part of the crew, the crew chief bombardier navigator, uh, had been picked up by, uh, what we called them gorillas. But, uh, and the reason we called them gorillas were, was that uh, at that time, each province chief had his own military. And we didn't know whether who they were or what they were, and uh, we didn't care as long as they weren't yet. Uh, but uh, uh, the guerrillas had picked up the rest of the crew, and by that evening we were all together. Great. As you sat there and watched that video, what were your feelings going through your head again, and how did that, how, how can you relate back to those that day 70 years ago? Well, I was thinking about that. Uh, the, the day was like the film. It was kind of foggy and rainy. Uh, and, uh, when, we, uh, when the PA system came on and said, uh, Army pilots, man your plane, uh, uh, I was on my way to breakfast. And, uh, uh, one of the, the bottom line for a co-pilot is to get to the airplane before the pilot for a couple of reasons. Is, number one is not to get in a one-way discussion. <laughs> and the other one is to try and do everything that the pilot wouldn't have to do when he gets there. Uh, and uh, as a crew, uh, we had talked about this. And we all made it to the airplane before uh, Colonel Doolittle, and uh, we pulled the props through and uh, so forth. Uh, we went over all the checklists and did things that uh, he wouldn't have to do. So when he came, we reported to him that we were ready. When, when did he find out that he was going to Tokyo? Uh, two days at sea the PA system came on and said, this force is bound for Tokyo. <laughs> uh, uh, up to that point, uh, and, uh, uh, the, some of the Navy personnel were not too happy about uh, a bunch of Army carpetbaggers taking up <laughs> all, all their uh, 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 deck space because they they had to have their airplanes on the lower deck. Uh, but uh, once uh, they found out where we were going, uh, everything was, uh, they couldn't have done more for us. And, uh, we couldn't have done anything without the Navy. So when did you get selected to go on that crew? How long in advance uh, did they come find you? I could tell you a lot of things about that problem, but uh, to be truthful, uh, it was strictly a, a sequence of, uh, from the way I look at it, lucky uh, breaks. Uh, I was crewed up with an Army Air Corps pilot, and uh, we had completed uh, maybe a half the training when uh, he became ill uh, with appendicitis. And consequently, he was taken off. Uh, that happened on the day the Doodle came from Washington to Eglin Field. And uh, uh, I had gone to the uh, operations officer and told him that uh, the rest of the crew and I had talked to them over, and we still wanted to go. Uh, and there were six extra crews that were chanting at the bit to move into our spot if they found out that uh, we didn't have a pilot. Uh, the operations officer looked over his lists and so forth and said, uh, 
Well, the old man's coming in this afternoon. And I'll hurry up with him. And if you do okay, you got yourself a pie. And uh, uh, he was a captain. And I, I knew that Doolittle was uh, going to be the leader. But I had not heard a captain refer to his uh, leader as the old man. And I thought, Oh, now we get to fly with an old man. <laughs> Maybe that makes a good idea. <laughs> but happily, it turned out to be Duda. I think, I think that's all we have time for tonight. I know we could sit around and listen to Colonel Cole all night long. Let me tell you, though, that he is going to stay for the awards. And then we have a table over here in the corner where he has some lithos of the aircraft that he flew on that specific day, April 18th, 1942. He signed some of them. He'd be happy uh, to give them to you. All they ask is maybe a little donation for their Raiders Scholarship Fund. And so he'll stay around, have your picture taken with him. He's a great man and a true American hero. Thank you, Colonel Cole.